Hey everybody, welcome to week 12 of PS231. I hope you're all doing great, having a good time as we get toward the final push here. I've been saying final push here since week two, um, but it kind of all feels like it's part of the big capital P push, right? And, you know, last week in the previous lecture, I just sort of ruminated a little bit about <laughs> incomplete information. And I showed you a couple of different models where incomplete information plays not just an important role, but also an intuitive role, just to give you the, a sense about how incomplete information is a really important aspect of political processes or auctions. We sort of just took a nice leisurely stroll through that, and I actually just kind of want to keep that up. I just kind of want to show you more things at a somewhat leisurely pace so that you internalize this idea of types, this idea of uncertainty. One reason for that is that Simultaneous move incomplete information game theory, like we discussed last week and like we'll be discussing this week. It doesn't play a massive role in political science. It's kind of a bummer because I think it's the best way to get you thinking about types and uncertainty. But for the most part, people kind of go straight from extensive form games of complete information like we studied in the, the previous module of the class. And then they just go straight from there to incomplete information models uh, where there are still sequential moves. I actually think the simultaneous move incomplete information module that we're in right now is underappreciated, at least pedagogically, uh, but also substantively. There are a lot of situations where not only do you not know things about the other actors that are relevant in your strategic environment, but also where you don't observe what they did, be it perfectly or imperfectly where you are genuinely making a move as if simultaneous, the same way that our suspects were making moves as if simultaneous in The Prisoner's Dilemma, or that our drivers were making moves as if simultaneous in Chicken. You'll see in the weeks after this week that sequential moves with incomplete information are super interesting and super fun, but that doesn't mean that they're always the right tool for a given job. And I think both for pedagogical and substantive reasons, there are lots of important jobs that th this is the right tool for. You know, given that last week was just one gigantic motivation for what we'll be talking about this week, I don't need to motivate things too much, so let's just get straight to it. In the A block, I want to have a bit of a warm-up, bit of a refresher, so let's talk about a one-sided incomplete information model of public good provision. This is a very important area um, for both substantive and experimental slash technical reasons of political science. So we'll look at a canonical model of public good provision where I don't know your costs of paying into a public good. I don't know if you really want to pay into the public good, like would you be willing to pay into it even if I shirked? Or would you not be willing to? Given that I don't know that, I don't know if I want to shirk or not myself. So how do I go through, as the person that doesn't have the information, how do I go through the process of thinking through whether the low cost version of you that wants to be a uh, wants to be a good person and pay into a public good, I don't want to pay into the public good if I think that you're that person. But if you're a high cost person that doesn't want to pay into the public good, then I want to. So I have to think that through. I have to think through the fact that I live in a society with you. I want there to be a public good provided. If you have low enough costs that you're willing to do it by yourself, I'm happy to let you do so. But if you have high costs, I don't want you to do so. So sort of there's a there's a baton of responsibility and you know whether or not you want to take it and I don't. So then how often am I going to take that baton of responsibility myself, even though that might sometimes lead to a wasteful outcome? In the B block, I actually just want to show you a very stylized game. Uh, it, it will have nothing to do with politics per se. And you're like, oh, that's very exciting. I'll just fast forward through that entire block. Please make sure you timestamp it, fat man, because I'm not going to go near it. Okay, that's fine. But also it's kind of interesting because the big lesson that I want to show you, I want to use this stylized game to teach you an important lesson. More information can hurt. And you're like, how could more information hurt? Well, you'd be surprised, actually. If you are able to condition your actions on your type, and I know that you can do that, I know that you might be specializing. That means that in turn that you wouldn't be able to hedge your bets in a credible way. You're going to actually, I'm going to use this game to show that if you can condition your behavior on your type, and I know that, 
I, as the person that doesn't have information, can take advantage of you because I know that the two versions of you are going to do something that allows me to succeed. So more information can hurt in some situations. It's a very powerful idea because I don't know about you, but I think most people would say, of course, more information helps. And then the worst case scenario is that you ignore that information, right? Maybe you behave as if you didn't get that information, but in, in our game, that's not going to be reliable, right? You're not going to be able to credibly say, oh, and by the way, I'm going to ignore this information that I've been given. You're not going to be able to do that. That won't be equilibrium behavior. So this simple little fable, this little mathematical fable will teach you the important lesson that more information can hurt. And then the C block, I want to get back to nitty gritty politics by doing a model of a trade war. Two-sided incomplete information this time. We'll go all the way through a two-sided incomplete information game and find its equilibria, where the idea here is that we don't know whether the other country that we're thinking about having a, this trade war with, um, we don't know if they're sort of unilateral traders or bilateral traders. Are they liberals or are they mercantilists? Are they protectionists or are they open, open politics types? Uh, and we'll see that there's a lot of very interesting politics that emerge in this highly relevant model of trade wars. So let's call this Bayesian Smorgasbord, part two, which if you haven't started your band name that yet, then you have failed this class. Um, I think that we should be able to see some, some big political lessons, some super abstract lessons. You should get... You should get it from lots of different angles, which should allow you to get a deep understanding that the role that information plays in politics and in strategy more generally. So it should be a pretty fun way to really hone those informational intuitions, and that'll get us really in place to talk about extensive form games of incomplete information in the final few weeks of the class. So I think this is going to be a really important bridge week for us. Let's get started. So here in the A block, I want to introduce a simple, straightforward model of public good provision. So remember that a public good is a good that is both non-excludable and non-rival. What does that mean? Well, a good is excludable if I, the proprietor of it, the, the vendor of it or something like that, can stop other people from enjoying that good. So for example, uh, you know, here, here's, here's, my, here's my Yeti full of hot honey lemon water with some ginger in it now. You know, I can, I can stop you. I have recourse that stops you from taking this, right? I have, I have some right to this according to the current customs and laws that we, that we enjoy. And in particular, the person that sold this to me could have stopped me from just taking it out of the store. So I bought this at the, at the University Bookstore at Florida State. And they could have stopped me. They could have said, hey, stop that. Don't you dare. If you take that from this store, we will call the police and you will be done. So so, so this is this is mine in a sense, right? In a way, the clean air is not mine. In a way, that security is not mine. And a good is rival if one person's consumption of it sort of takes away, right? So if, if I take a sip of my water, that water is now gone, right? My, my consumption of this hot honey lemon water precludes the consumption of that same little milliliter or so of it by somebody else. I took one milliliter of water out of this. It is currently in my esophagus. However, if I take a breath of air, it's true, there's a little bit less oxygen around me and a little bit more CO2, but not in a meaningful sense, right? My consumption of clean air doesn't necessarily take away from the stores of it. The stores of that are not meaningfully stopped. That means that all four kinds of goods can be put into a little typology depending on whether they are rival or non-rival and excludable or non-excludable. If it is excludable and rival, that means it's a private good like most standard consumer goods, right? So, so my microphone is mine and my taking it away took one meaningful microphone out of the store of microphones. If a good is not excludable, but is rival, you know, that's what we refer to as a common pool resource. That's something like, like, like resources that need to be managed, like, like wildlife or timber 
or, res or sort of natural resources, oil, gas, etc. Those are goods where it is possible to, to overfish. It is possible to chop down too many trees in ways that it isn't possible for me to breathe too much air. My favorite goods are ones that are non-rivalrous, but are excludable. So you can keep somebody from, from enjoying it, but once somebody is enjoying it, that doesn't meaningfully stop somebody else from enjoying it. Those are called club goods. So for example, if you go to the movies, back when people went to the movies, the owner of the movie theater can stop you from enjoying the movie unless you pay, right? You can't just sort of walk into the movie theater and that's it. There's a person taking the tickets, right? However, once you're in there, your consumption, your watching of the movie, the person next to you doesn't have less movie to watch just because you were watching the movie too. The same way that if you took, you know, if, if I took a sip of this, you can't, you can't take the same sip of water that I take. But you can watch the same 30 seconds of a movie that I do at the same time. So that's a club good. And then finally, uh, public goods are those that are non-excludable and non-rival. Clean air, security, and one issue with different kinds of goods. So, so private goods, it's not as difficult to come up with appropriate mechanisms to distribute them well, right? So, so markets are reasonably acceptable ways, depending on whom you ask, to distribute private goods. However, public goods, common pool resources, this, these are tricky to come up with appropriate ways to ensure that they are efficiently allocated. In particular, it's with common pool resources, it is very easy to over exploit them. Tragedy of the common sort of stuff. If we have a public green, if there's a big field and we can't meaningfully stop shepherds or farmers from allowing their cattle to graze, well, next thing you know, now there isn't any grass left because there wasn't a way for us to stop people from overusing the common pool resource. Public goods are also difficult to provide, right? So clean air is difficult to provide. Security is difficult to provide. And consequently, it's interesting to think about appropriate ways to ensure that public goods are provided in ways that reflect society's preferences, despite the fact that they create massive collective action problems. You might not realize it, but you've already studied models of public good provision and problems thereof. With the prisoner's dilemma. In the prisoner's dilemma, there's a strong individual incentive to do something that ends up not being best for everybody, right? So we both defect in the prisoner's dilemma, which is analogous to neither of us provides a public good. And so even though we would both do better if the public good had been provided through our mutual cooperation, the incentives just aren't there. And here I want to demonstrate that there's a lot of wrinkles in thinking through public good provision when I don't know something about how much you want to provide that public good if you have private information about your costs of provision. So let's queue up a simple theory of one-sided and incomplete information for public good provision. So this is gonna look a lot like our introductory Bakker Stravinsky from last week. Let me just queue up one version of the game and then just like last time I'll break it into two in a second. But first let me just call up a, a, the, the simple straightforward simultaneous move game of public good provision in the abstract. I'm back baby, I'm back! So here's the idea. Either of us, I'm player one and you're player two, I'm role player, you're column player, per usual. And the idea is this. Both of us can either pay or not pay into a public good. We can either contribute to the public good or not contribute to the public good. Okay? That could be that we both, you know, clean up some of the area around us to try to reduce pollution. One of us could be the person that throws a party back when parties were a thing, although it seems like parties are still a thing, doesn't it? So both of us would like to enjoy the public good, which will happen if at least one of us pays into it. But paying into the public good is costly. So in particular, if both of us pay into the public good, then we both get to enjoy one happiness point from experiencing the wonderfulness of that public good. But we must also pay some cost. We'll say C sub 1 for me and C sub 2 for you. Throughout, the Cs are going to be strictly positive. right? So the idea here is that you really... Your very favorite outcome is the one where somebody provides a public good and you get to not have to pay for it. You get to be a free rider. Okay. So start from this 1 minus C1, 1 minus C2. 
And just to, to drive that point home, if you pay into the public good and I don't, then I get one full happiness point and you get one minus C2 happiness points. Right? You still have to pay. I just get to enjoy the clean air. I get to enjoy the security. I get to enjoy the party. And similarly, if I paid and you didn't, then it's one minus C1 for me and one for you. You get to enjoy all the benefits of the public good without paying the costs. And then finally, if neither of us pays into the public good, then it's a zero, zero outcome. So everybody's favorite outcome is what happens if, if somebody provided the public good and you didn't have to. And then there's this outcome where we both bought into it. And then there's this outcome where neither of us paid into it. So that's a simple, straightforward model of public good provision. So throughout, we're going to assume that my costs are strictly less than one. Okay, we'll assume that, that C sub one is somewhere between zero and one. And we'll see, actually, we need to condition a little bit harder on a little bit later on, but not in a way that's going to throw us off. So throughout this analysis, my personal cost of paying to the public good is greater than zero and strictly less than one, which means that my best response, the, the, the real straw starting the drink here, is that my best response to you not providing the public good is to provide the public good, because that means that one minus C is strictly greater than zero. However, let's leave open the possibility that you have costs that are so high that you wouldn't want to provide the public good even if I didn't. In particular, suppose that there are two types of you. Suppose first that there's a version of you that has low costs of public good provision, and then suppose also there's another type of you that has high costs of public good provision. In particular, let's suppose that the low cost version of you has C sub two strictly less than one, so that you would like to provide the public good if I didn't, just the same as I was discussing for myself a second ago. So for the low cost type, C sub two is strictly less than one. And for the high cost version of you, C sub two is strictly greater than one, so that even if, even if I didn't provide the public good, you would enjoy it, but not enough to outweigh your high costs in this high cost world. We're gonna say that you know which type you are, so we'll, we'll have separate information sets for you, but I don't know which type you are. I have only probabilistic expectations over that. And just to keep life super simple, let's say I think that you're a low cost type with probability one half, and a high cost type with probability one half. Now remember, that the basic idea here is that you're going to get to condition your choices. You can choose a different strategy depending on which type you are. So the low cost type of you will do one thing and the high cost type of you will do another. They might be the same thing, but you get to say, it could be pay, 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 not pay, not pay, pay, or not pay, not pay. So you get to choose a different column, right? You're allowed to choose a different column in these two worlds, whereas I only get to choose one and only one row. That's the whole idea here, is that you get to condition your behavior in ways that I don't. That in turn means that I have no choice as the role player, but to think through my best response to each of your co uh, combinations of columns, okay? So let's create the, the two row four column table of my role players expected utilities for paying into the public good and not paying into the public good. Notice that this is going to be a little bit boring in the top row. So if I pay into the public good, then no matter what you do and no matter what type you are, irrespective of both your behavior and your type, I get one minus C1 happiness points. Why? Well, the public good is provided because it takes only one of us to do it. So, so one, I get one happiness point for sure, and I and I paid. So, so minus C one, right? Throughout the entire top row, both types and both columns, it's one minus C one everywhere for me. Okay, one minus C one for role player, no matter what. If they pay into the public good, it's one minus C one, no uncertainty required. However, if I don't pay into the public good. Now it depends on what you did. I don't know why I said that with that particular inflection, but let's just go with it. So suppose that I don't pay into the public good and you are playing pay, pay. Both types of you pay into the public good, okay? Well, if that means that half of the time you're the low cost type, you're paying into the public good, I'm getting one happiness point. 
half of the time you're the high cost type, you're paying into the public good. I get one happiness point. One half times one plus one half times one is just one. For the middle two, for the middle two, that means that you're either paying when low cost and not paying when high cost or vice versa. Either way, what's happening is half of the time I get a happiness point and half of the time I don't. So in these two cells, I get one half of a happiness point in expectation because half of the time you're paying in and half of the time you're not. Finally, if I'm not paying into the public good and neither type of you is either, then that means I get zero for sure. Okay, zero happiness points for sure. So this is a little bit more straightforward than it was even in the Bakker Stravinsky example. Notice that given the assumptions that we've made up to this point, if you are playing both types pay, high, low cost type pays, high, high cost type pays, if both of you are paying, then I could either pay and get one minus C1 happiness points or not pay and get one. Of course, I would rather not pay. If I knew that both types of you were paying the public good, I wouldn't. I would ride for free. I'd be a free rider. Similarly, because my costs are less than one, if I knew that neither type of you was paying into the public good, neither the high cost type nor the low cost type, if I knew that that was true, then I would pay into the public good. My costs are low. My costs are relatively low. And so if I knew that neither type of you were paying in, then I would pay in. However, in these middle two rows, it depends. And that's nice because it just gives us two chances to, to, it's a chance to work two different versions of the same example. So let's suppose for now that C1, my cost, is, is very low. Suppose it's strictly less than one half. Well, then that means that one minus C1 is strictly greater than one half. If C1 is, great, is less than one half, then one minus C1 is strictly greater than one half. You can work that out if you need to. So if my costs are low, then one minus my costs is high. So that means in these middle two columns, under the assumption that C1 is strictly less than one half, under that supposition for now, that right now that I'm just hypothesizing that that was true. If that were true, then my best response to either of the ones where pay, not pay, and not pay, pay, I would rather pay. 1 minus C1 beats 1 half, 1 minus C1 beats 1 half. Now we need to check to see if these four cells that have stars in them, are you best responding to my best response to you? So let's just work from left to right. Consider first the situation where I am not paying because I think that maybe you're both paying, both types of you are paying. Let's go back up to the matrix. So the low cost type of you is perfectly happy Right, so, so even though I'm not paying, you're paying, you get one minus C2 happiness points. For the low cost type, that is a best response. That beat zero for the low cost version of you. So this is fine. However, over here in the world where you have high costs, I didn't pay, I'm not paying. You're getting one minus C1 happiness points if you're paying, which is strictly worse than zero because you're the high cost type. The high cost type doesn't want to pay in no matter what. So this is not an equilibrium. And the reason for that is, the, the high cost type of you would like to deviate. I was best responding to PP. That, that was the best response for the low cost version of you, but not for the high cost version of you. So that's not an equilibrium. Let's move one column over. So suppose that I was paying and you were paying if a low cost type and not paying if a high cost type. Well, let's go back up to the matrices and observe that the high cost version of you is happy, right? So you're getting a full happiness point over here. So the low cost type of you was thinking to themselves, well, wait a second here. Yeah, I don't, I have low cost, so I don't mind paying in, but I don't want to pay in when you're paying in because I could deviate. I could get one happiness point. So this is not an equilibrium. Similarly, if we move over one column to the world where I'm paying, you are not paying if low costs and paying if high costs. This sounds doomed from the start, right? So we go back up to the matrix. The low cost version of you is happy because I'm paying and you're not, that's fine. You get, you're getting a full happiness point, that's great. However, the high cost version of you is saying, well, one minus C2, that, that's worse than one. You're paying, I would rather not pay. Even though my cost, it has nothing to do with how high my costs are, it's just that I have costs. So that's not equilibrium. Finally, consider the situation where I am paying into the public good and neither the low cost nor the high cost version of you is. Well. It's the best response for me. We already worked that out. Right now, the, the low cost version of you is getting a full happiness point. 
The high cost version of you is getting a full happiness point. This is an equilibrium. This is an equilibrium. This is what you would call a Bayesian Nash equilibrium in a very simple sense. It's really just a Nash equilibrium. So that was the example. That's what happened in this example. If my costs were very low, my costs were so low that I was even willing to, I was willing to err on the pay side. Really, that's what's happening. Super low costs, C1 less than one half means the, the row players willing to err on the nice side, willing to err on the I buy inside. We all have that friend, right? And then given that, the only equilibrium behavior was for the for both types of you not to not to enter, because you know that I'm erring on the high side. What if that weren't true? So consider the situation now where C sub one is strictly greater than one half. Okay. Now what that does is it takes these two stars and it moves them down. That means that if I thought that one and only one type of you was paying into the public good, that's enough for me. My costs are so high that I don't want to err on the high side now. Now I want to err on the low side. I want to err on the low side. Notice that for the same reasons as before, it is not an equilibrium for me to not pay into the public good and for you to both pay into the public good, both types of you, because then the high cost type of you would rather deviate to not providing. Okay, so that gets rid of the rightmost. And just as before, because my cost is strictly less than one, I'm okay with being the asymmetric provider if need be. And so that means that if you, neither of you is paying into the public good, then I would pay and this would be an equilibrium. So that's still an equilibrium, just like before. The question is here in the middle. So consider the situation now where I'm not paying into the public good. The low cost version of you is paying into the public good and the high cost version of you is not paying into the public good. Well, let's think that through. It's a best response on my side. So the question is, is it a best response for both types of you? Is it a best response for you to pay into the public good here and not pay into the public good here when I'm not paying? Well, let's think that through. Well, the low cost version of you is getting one minus C2 happiness points, which is strictly better than the zero that you would get if you didn't, if you didn't pay in. So that's fine. And the high cost version of you is getting zero happiness points, which is better than the one minus C2 happiness points you'd get if you paid in because here you're, you have high cost. So that's not a profitable deviation for the high cost type. Therefore, neither type of you wants to deviate. This is now an equilibrium where it was not before. Now in the, in the, in the final situation, let me just get rid of it real fast. In the third column over, both types of you want to deviate. I'm not providing. The low cost version of you is not providing they would like to provide. And the high cost version of you is providing, they would like to not provide. So that's not an equilibrium. But now we have a new equilibrium. We have a new equilibrium. So now we have two pure strategy Nash equilibria of this game. One where I provide and neither version of you does. And one where I don't provide, the low cost version of you does and the high cost version of you doesn't. This is a great lesson in equilibrium analysis. Why? Notice that my costs going up, my C1 went up, they crossed one half. And because of that, you do worse in one of the equilibria. And, and the only equilibrium, so, so back when C1 was, was low, there was a unique equilibrium where neither type of you had to pay into the public good. When my costs went up, the low cost version of you was thinking, well, I, I I got to pay in. I want to pay in. And now Rob isn't erring on the high side anymore. So the fact that my cost went up ended up hurting you. Even though you have the private information. The low cost, the, the private information actually helped me to be able to credibly say, I'm going to err on the low side now. So the low cost ver version of you would better step up. That's what just happened. We went from a world where your costs were, you know, my costs were so low that I didn't have to say step it up to the low cost version of you. But once my costs got high, kind of how this semester is feeling right now, now I got to tell you to step it up. The low cost version of you has to step it up. So that's the step it up equilibrium. That's pretty cool, right? One simple little tweak. Once we crossed a flashpoint for my costs, my costs going up hurt you. 
in one of the equilibria. It meant that we went from a unique equilibrium that was really good on, on your side to multiple equilibria, one of which is still great for you, and the other one requires some of, some of the time you have to pitch in. Note also that back when, the, when my costs were low, when, when C sub 1 was less than 1 half, in the unique equilibrium of that game, the public good always got provided by me. However, in the other equilibrium, when I have high costs, in the you step it up equilibrium, the public good only gets provided half the time, in particular, the half of the time that you're the low cost type. Right? So this multiple types thing, coupled with high costs on my side, meant that the public good only got provided some of the time, which is tragic. So this simple model of public good provision with incomplete information highlights not only the difficult nuances with public good provision in general, but also the interesting relationship between information and costs. Essentially, when my costs were low, I always pitched in as a way of buying insurance. I didn't know if it was the high cost version of you or the low cost version of you. Then I didn't want to put up with the possibility of you being the high cost version. And then I don't get any goodies. So I err on the high side, which is called buying insurance. And we're good. However, once my costs got too high, once I didn't want to buy all of the insurance that the, that the local State Farm agent was willing to provide, once my costs got a little bit too high, now that's a qualitatively different world. Qualitatively, these equilibria are very different from one another substantively. Not to mention that the oddness thing holds too. So this game has a third equilibrium of mixed strategies, which you can find in the comfort of your own home if you'd like. But that alone, in, in any club that you're in, any club that you're in, you know, somebody's got to be the person that, that maintains the Instagram or has to be the, the keeper of the, they have to take notes at the meetings, which I'm sure is really crappy on Zoom. Somebody's got to be the one that, that does things. Somebody's got to be the one that does things. And when there's private information about who's good at what, you know, what things are easy for some people, once there's private information on that, given that we need one and only one person to step it up, there's a lot of wrinkles to that. Any club that you're in, those of you that are in fraternities or sororities or something like that, there's public good needs aplenty. Those of you that, that work in an office, right? If you work in an office, yeah, you have a job and they give you a job description and your job is to do that. But then you also know that there's all sorts of little incidental things around the office that need done. So for just as a stupid example, at your office, if you work in an office, you know, everybody might pay in for the office coffee. Okay, but somebody's still got to go be the person that gets the coffee with the money that we all pitched in. Somebody's got to be the person that goes and gets the coffee. Somebody has to step it up and get the coffee. And then once you get the coffee, everybody gets to enjoy it because it's the public office coffee. Who's going to be the person to get the coffee? If I don't know, if my costs of getting the coffee are low, if I love driving and I just love Walmart, right? And I don't know if you love driving and love Walmart, then I'm just going to go. I'm just going to handle it myself and that'll be that. But if I don't know and I'm thinking, well, I might be able to not have to get, I might not have to go to Walmart today. Now there's wrinkles. Think about all of the good things that could happen if two conflicting, but also not conflicting groups, like political parties maybe, if one of them would just step it up. Things would be different. But there's a lot of incentives not to do so, both on the cost side and on the information side. So, so this simple model of one-sided incomplete information in a public good provision, first of all, it can't be that simple if that's how long the title of it is, right? But there's a lot in there. It's a beautiful model. And it actually, this is a model that's, that's performed relatively well and has been wrong in interesting ways in the laboratory. So throughout the 1990s, this it was very popular to play this particular game in laboratories with college students. I'll post a couple of those papers on, on Piazza because they're pretty straightforward reads and it's interesting to learn more about how public goods get provided in these not just strategic but also informationally rich environments. I hope that this sort of drove the lesson home that, that more information, it doesn't necessarily have to make things go better, right? So whether or not information helps or hurts you, here you have more information than me. Whether or not that's good depends on my costs, right? 
So in the world where I have low costs, yeah, having private information really helps you out. But in the world where I have high costs, it may or may not, we don't know. I want to drive that point home by talking about how more information need not be better in a strict sense over in the B block. Very good. So here in the middle block, we're going to get a little abstract. I just want to make a point to you somewhat abstractly. And it's, it's, I mean, I could just say to you, more information hurts. More information can hurt sometimes. More information might hurt. Um, but it means more if I give you a fable, right? So just the same way that I could say, oh, well, sometimes people pretend like they didn't like something that they didn't win. I could say, oh, there was once upon a time, there was a fox that really wanted some grapes. Okay, so the fable helps. The fable helps. So I'm just going to draw a little toy game, and that little toy game is going to make this deep point that more information can hurt. Just in case I'm being too subtle, as is my custom, I'll just put it up here even as we speak. There's no way that I aimed that right. But somewhere, somewhere like this is what I want to do. More information can hurt. Okay, so here's the idea. So what I want to do is I just want to draw the same shape of a game, but two, with two different sets of payoffs. Eventually I'll link them via types, but not just yet. So here's one version of the game. Boom. And here's another version of the game. Boom. In my mind, they sound different. Synesthesia is a nightmare. So in both games, role player, that's me, can go up or down. Okay. And column player, that's you, can go left, center, or right. Throughout, you'll notice I have the same exact payoffs in both of these matrices, right? So, so row player has the same exact payoffs. One, two, one, zero, one, zero. Notice also that column player, that's you, has the same payoffs in the left column, right? So it, it's two epsilon and two. And throughout this analysis, we're gonna say that epsilon is somewhere between zero and one half, strictly so. So epsilon is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than one half. It's just a little bit of noise that we're adding to the game. And the idea is that in one of these games, you like the center column. There's a three epsilon and a three. And in another of these games, you like the right column. There's, the, there's where the three epsilon and three are. Otherwise, it's zero. So sort of a key to the trick. And I know I'm not supposed to tell you how the magic trick happens before the magic trick happens. But a big key here is that the, the left column for you represents hedging a bet. Right? That's your middle outcome in both games. However, in one game, you you like you go right column and then center column and then middle column. And in the other game, you go center column, then left column, then right column. You might be beginning to see the essence of the structure of the point that I'm going to try to make here. Now, suppose for now that, that we both have... Neither of us can detect the difference between these games. Suppose for now that you don't know which world we're in, and I don't know which world we're in. All that we know is that this world happens with probability one half, and this world happens with probability one half. Let's think through the Nash equilibria of that game, which is just a matter of us both smooshing the table. We're going to smoosh both of these games into one smooshed game, okay? Now notice that because my payoffs don't depend on, on which game we're playing, right? The state of the world doesn't influence my, my payoffs here. So I'm just gonna fill all my payoffs into this mush game. One, two, one, zero, one, zero. Now notice because your, in the left column, your payoffs don't depend on the type either. So it's just two epsilon and epsilon either way. However, in the center column, in the center column, half of the time you get the good payoff, either three epsilon or three, and half of the time you get the bad payoff, zero. So that means that here in the center column, one half times three epsilon, plus one half times zero, that's three epsilon over two. And one half times three plus one half times zero, that's just three halves. And the same is gonna go over here in the right column. One half times zero plus one half times three epsilon is three epsilon over two and one half times zero plus one half times three is three halves. So if you didn't have information and I didn't have information, if we both had uncertainty about the world, aleatory uncertainty, neither of us knows the true state of the world, 
We have to take expectations over that. In that situation, this game has a unique Nash equilibrium. And in that unique Nash equilibrium, I go down and you go left. I get two happiness points and you get two happiness points. That is the unique Nash equilibrium of this game. You can confirm that there are no other pure strategy Nash equilibria. And there are no other mixed strategy Nash equilibria. That's it for this game. So this game, in this game, there's unique equilibrium. I get two happiness points and you get two happiness points. Now let's adjust this model to say that you know the state of the world. So I'm gonna split your information set into two because you can now detect the two games from one another. You can condition your behavior on which game we're playing. Observe that in this game, it, when, when it's this type of you, the type of you that likes the right column, Notice that for this type of view, right is strictly dominant. It strictly dominates left. Three epsilon is bigger than two epsilon and three is bigger than two. And it strictly dominates center. Three epsilon is bigger than zero and three is bigger than zero. So for this type of view, the only reasonable thing to expect is that you play right. This is gonna make life a little bit easier when we go through all the contingencies on my end. Similarly, for this type of view, center is a strictly dominant strategy. 3 epsilon 3, that beats 0, 0, and that beats 2 epsilon 2. So the only reasonable thing to expect this type of you to do is to play center. So type 1 must play right, type 2 must play center. A reasonable question then is, what is my best response to that strategy, because now I don't have to go through the whole table. I know that there's only one thing that's reasonable for you to do. This type of you plays right, this type of you plays center. That's the only reasonable thing to expect, so I don't have to work through all those contingencies. All I have to do is say, well, in expectation, is up or down better for me when I know that this type of you is playing right and this type of you is playing center. There isn't a whole lot to work through here, because notice, no matter what I do, if I go up, it's one, one, one. It doesn't matter what you're playing or how often, no matter what happens, I get one happiness point for going up. So that's one happiness point if I'm in the up row. If I'm in the down row, we'll notice that in both the R column and the C column, it doesn't really matter. I get zero happiness points there. No matter what, if I play D against R or C, irrespective of your type, I get zero happiness points. So that's zero. So the unique best response for me to your strictly dominant strategy, RC, is to play up. That gives me one happiness point rather than zero. So in other words, the unique Nash equilibrium of the version of the model where there's two types of you, and you know your type, the unique Nash equilibrium is I play up, you play right if you're type one, and you play center if you're type two. Well, that means that your equilibrium payoff the, high, the, 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 the type one of you, we're at upright. Type one of you is at upright, and you're getting three epsilon. And the other type of you is at up center, and is getting three epsilon. So your payoff for both types in this model are getting three epsilon. We said that epsilon was somewhere between zero and one half. Which means that your payoff in the world where you have information, your payoff in the world where you have more information is strictly lower for both types of you than it was in the world where you didn't have information where you got a two. More information hurt you and it hurt me. The fact that you could differentiate yourself on what type you were hurt you and it hurt me. So what happened was, because this version of you was like, I like R best and then L and then C. I like right, then left, then center. And this version of you was like, I like center, then left, then right. So, so either time you had a compromise, right? And when you didn't have information and you had to, and you had to hedge bets because you didn't know which world we were in, that meant that the compromise was best for you. That made left the best thing that you could do. And my best response to that was a very good thing for both of us. That's what got us the two, two. But if you get to tailor your action to the state that you are, if you get to tailor your action to what type you are in the world where you have the information, that meant that you didn't have to compromise anymore. You no longer had to compromise. If you, if you knew for sure that you were in the world where R was best, you played R. And if you knew for sure that you were in the world that C was best, you played C. However, in those two worlds, my best response 
in those two worlds, which was to go up, wasn't as good from your perspective as if I had played down. So you tailoring your action to your type, yeah, it was good for you in the immediate short term, but my best response to that wasn't good for you. You were actually better off in the world where you didn't know what was best, you had to play the compromise, and that incentivized me to play down, which is, which is generally beneficial for you. Note also that you could not credibly say that you were going to ignore this information. There's no reasonable way for you to say that you were going to ignore that information. Suppose that you said to me, well, yeah, I know the state of the world, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna play as if I didn't. Let's play the game smush, let's both smush. Let's do the thing, let's both smush, and that yields a Pareto improving equilibrium, right? So you would say, if you play, if you play down, if you choose the down row, I will choose the left column and we'll be good. Okay? So I play the, uh, let's say that I played the down row. Now we're in the down row. On the down row. That's an old song. Jeez, that's an old song. But you can't, you can't reliably say that you're not going to deviate. You can't ignore that information because now you could deviate. You're getting two happiness points here. Yeah. But if you had played right, you'd get three. And over here, if you had played center, you'd get three. You can't say you'll ignore the information. There's no reason for me to believe that you will ignore that information. There's no reason for me to believe that because it's not credible. You can try to bait me into, into playing down all you want to. I wasn't born yesterday. So the idea here is that more information can hurt if it incentivizes you to, to tailor your actions to chase after what is best in a very state of the world specific way. And in particular, if that also yields other players to do things that are not generally beneficial for you. There are other scenarios that demonstrate that more information can hurt, but I don't think any is quite as beautiful as this. And then that last part, the fact that you could never credibly say that you were going to ignore that information because I would say, yeah, fat chance. That's the essence of incomplete information game theory. So this perverse result that demonstrates the more result can hurt also reinforces some really important logic, both about informational game theory and about Nash in general. I would say fat chance. I would know that you're not best responding. No matter how hard you promised, no matter how hard you promised that you were going to play left, there's no way that you would stay there. It's not a steady state. It's not a steady state. I have no interest in not going to steady state, so I would play up. Yeah, it sucks on my part, but it beats the zero that I would get if either type of you deviated on me, which I know would happen. You can never unremember. You can try your best, but there's no way that you could credibly get rid of that information. You couldn't clear that part of your hard drive. So I hope you remember that. I know that this is a little bit abstract. I know this is, you know, there's not easy to tell political stories about this. This is just a, a more general point. This is bigger than just political stories. More information can hurt. So I have one final story I'd like to tell you today, and it is a trade war model, which we'll be talking about over in the C block. All right, so I just want to finish our treatment of simultaneous move incomplete information game theory with a really nice application that's highly relevant for a lot of politics in the last few years and probably will be for years to come. So let's queue up a simple model of a trade war. I have no thoughts on any of this. I have no thoughts on, on whether, I have no thoughts on any of this. This is, I have precisely zero opinions. This is not an issue that is important to me or anything. I just wanted to state that disclaimer. I have nothing to say on this topic. So the basic idea goes like this. There's going to be two states, state one and state two. And the idea is that both of them can come in one of two types. So there's going to be two-sided incomplete information. This is hard, right? So if you open up a, a political science journal with formal theory papers in it, two-sided incomplete information is a lot rarer than one-sided incomplete information like we've been doing up to this point. Two-sided incomplete information is, is difficult to think through. 
there's going to be some simplifying maneuvers made in this particular model to try to keep things simple. Otherwise, the number of competition combinations grows very large very quickly. But I think that the two sidedness here is really relevant because in international relations, no state is able to reliably say that they know everything about the foreign policy mechanisms in other states. Right. So if I'm the United States and you're China, there is no reasonable way for me to know what your true trade preferences are. And similarly, there's no way for you to know what my true trade preferences are. There's no reason to think that one of us has more information than the other. There must be two sided and complete information in many interactions of this type. So there are two types of us. And in broad brushstrokes, you can think about one type of us as protectionist. We always want to have protectionist foreign policies about trade. We always want to limit trade to try to increase our exports and reduce our imports. And the other type of us we might refer to as a cautious liberal. So I'll call that C. So, so type C of us would like to have free trade, but only if both of us have free trade. Otherwise, we want to limit if both of us want to limit. Okay. So the, the protectionist type always wants to limit trade. And the cautious liberal is open to the idea of free and open trade, but doesn't want to get caught unawares by somebody that takes advantage. They don't want to have that asymmetric outcome of they don't limit free trade and the other country does. The next thing you know, your market gets flooded. So before I draw in any games, let's just say that role player can either be the protectionist type or the cautious liberal. And column player can either be the protectionist type or the cautious liberal. So we have a, a two by two type space. Protectionist, 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 liberal, liberal, protectionist, liberal, liberal. Regardless of the type, we have one of two strategies. We can either have a, a limited trade policy or a free trade policy. Okay, so that's L and F. So let me just fill in each of these matrices real fast. So in the world where we're both protectionists, in the world where we're both protectionists, my favorite outcome is the one where I limited trade and you didn't. That gets me three happiness points. And similarly, the world where you limited trade and I didn't gets you three happiness points. And throughout the model, if you open your borders to trade and the other state doesn't, that's going to get you zero happiness points for having your market flooded. If we both limit trade, that'll be one happiness point for you and one happiness point for me. And if neither of us limits trade, if we both have free trade, that'll be 2-2. Two, two. You can work out for yourself that this is a prisoner's dilemma. Right? So for both protectionists, this is a prisoner's dilemma. And we both use IESDS or NASH. No, no matter how you get there, we're both going to limit trade here, right? That's uh, if, if we knew that we were here, if we knew, which we don't, if we knew that we were here, we would limit. We would both limit. Let's go down to the world where I am now a cautious liberal and you are still protectionist. Okay. Your preferences will remain exactly the same. And if you're a cautious liberal, one and only one thing changes. If you're a cautious liberal, your favorite outcome is free trade, free trade. Your second favorite outcome is you, you limited and they had free trade. So all that happens is we switch one number and that ruins the dominance that so, so now there isn't a strict dominance thing. So if we, we if we knew that we were playing this game, you wouldn't have an IESDS prisoner dilemma sort of thing happening. The same is going to go up in the world where I'm a protectionist and you're a cautious liberal. Now, the only thing that's going to change is that your preferences will shift. Your favorite outcome is free trade, free trade. And your second favorite outcome is you limited and I had free trade. Finally, in the world where we both are cautious liberals and we wind up with a 3-3 over at uh, free trade, free trade, zero, two, and two, zero off the main diagonal. And that one, one just stays there for limited, limited. Notice that if we knew that we were both cautious liberals, this would be a stag hunt. There are two pure strategy Nash equilibria, one of which Pareto dominates the other. And the question is, does one of us want to peel off? Just like in the stag hunt that we talked about several weeks ago now. Just think about how far we've come. Just think about all the accumulated stuff, all the little snippets. All these little tiny little things, they just keep coming up. Nothing ever comes up just once. I know that makes it frustrating because like you think, oh, I don't have to know that anymore. And there's no such thing as not have to know. But it's just, it's fun to watch it accumulate sometimes. And Marie Kondo disagrees with that very strenuously. 
but I would say that the trade war game sparks much joy for me. The last thing that we need in this model is some set of probabilities about how likely it is that we are in each situation. So suppose that each state is protectionist with probability P. So with probability P, I'm protectionist, and with an independent probability P, you are protectionist. So in other words, the probability that we're up here in the world where we're both protectionists, that's P squared, P times P. The probability that we're in this cell where I'm protectionist and you're a cautious liberal is P times one minus P. The probability that in the world where I'm a cautious liberal and you're a protectionist is one minus P times P. And the probability that we're both cautious liberals is one minus P squared. You can, in the comfort of your own home, work out that these all add to one. Now this is daunting. Are you daunted? Is there, what, is that even a real, relatively thing? No, of course it is. Because if, if you couldn't be daunted, then there'd be no such thing as dauntless and the, and the stupid divergent novels wouldn't mean anything. This is very daunting. There's a lot of model here. There's a lot of model here, right? But we can do it. We can do it. We can simplify it. We can, we can make our lives a little bit easier. How? So let's just start in the world where we're both protectionists. Okay, so, so in, this, in, in the world where we're both protectionists, notice that for me, as mentioned before, limiting trade strictly dominates free trade. One is bigger than zero and three is bigger than two. And likewise for you, one is bigger than zero and three is bigger than two. And the same goes because the preferences don't change within a column or within a row. In general, the protectionist type has a strictly dominant strategy. The protectionist type always wants to limit. Okay, so there is not an equilibrium that asks the protectionist type to do anything other than limit. We know that for sure the protectionist type will limit. So let's look for a symmetric equilibrium for both players, the protectionist type limits, and for both players, the cautious liberal has free trade. Okay, let's see if there's an equilibrium of that type. So let's think about the expected utility that the free trade type of player one has for the strategy that we just mentioned, right? So, so hold fix the idea. So su suppose now that state two is limiting if they are the protectionist type and playing free trade if they're the cautious liberal, okay? Suppose that for now, and let's think about the expected utility that the cautious liberal type of player that state one experiences for, for playing the proposed strategy. Well, what we have so far is with probability P, with probability P, state two is the protectionist type and they play limit. And with probability one minus P, state two is the cautious liberal and they play free trade. So consider what happens if the cautious liberal type of state one plays limit. Let's just, let's just work that one out first. Well, with probability P, they're up against the protectionist type of state two, who is limiting and they get one happiness point. So that's one times P is P. And with probability one minus P, they're up against the cautious liberal type of state two, who is playing free trade. And that gets the cautious liberal type of, that means it's, it's limit against free. And for the cautious liberal type of state one, that's worth two happiness points. So that's two times one minus P. So that's P times two times one minus P. And if you work all that out and that's just two minus P. So the expected utility for the cautious liberal type of state one playing limit, given the strategy of state two that we're holding fixed is two minus P. Now what's their expected utility if they played free trade? Well, with probability P, they're up against the protectionist type of state two who is playing limit. And that means zero happiness points, zero happiness points, because then we're at free trade for me and limit for you. That's bad. Plus, well, with probability one minus P, state two is the cautious liberal type. The cautious liberal type is playing free trade and I get three happiness points. So that's three times one minus P, three minus three P. So when is free trade, the proposed strategy, a best response? Well, that means that three minus three P has gotta be greater than or equal to two minus P. Then you work all that out and that means P is less than or equal to one half. Now this game is fully symmetric. Everything that applies to one type of one state applies to that same type of the other state. Everything sort of goes in the same direction. So just to save time, I'll say, well, the analysis could be repeated for state two, which means 
that so long as P is less than one half, then there is a Nash equilibrium where for both states, the protectionist type limits trade as protectionist types are want to do. And the cautious liberal has free trade. That happens if P is less than one half, which means that the only time that free trade happens, so I play free trade, not only if I'm a cautious liberal, but also if I'm a cautious liberal and I think it's unlikely that you're a protectionist, P is less than one half. So P is sufficiently small. Your likelihood of being a protectionist is sufficiently small, but it is alone is insufficient for me to be a cautious liberal. That's why I call it cautious liberal. It's alone insufficient for me to be a cautious liberal. Not only do I have to want free trade, I also have to think that you're sufficiently likely that you want free trade too. Again, information and the gnashiness idea really kicks in together here. How often does free trade happen in this model then? Well, uh, what happen free trade happens if we're both cautious liberals. Right? If we're both cautious liberals, so if P is less than one half and we're both cautious liberals, then that means that free trade happens. So that happens when we're both, that's down here. So one minus P squared. So if P is low, let's say the P was a quarter. That means the one minus P is three quarters. Yeah. Which means that free trade happens in this model nine sixteenths of the time, about half the time, about half of the time. Now consider the possibility that both types of both player limit trade. So what is it possible for the protectionist to limit and the free trade to limit? Let's hold you fixed. Let's say that you both types of you were limiting. The protectionist you was limiting and the free trade you was limiting. And let's think about my expected utility of limiting if I'm the cautious liberal and if I'm the, the protectionist. However, notice that my preferences, irrespective of my type, are the same in the limiting column. It's always one. If you're limiting, then no matter what type I am, my, my utility for limiting is one and my utility for free trade is zero. So in other words, in the game as we've drawn it up, there's always an equilibrium irrespective of P where everybody limits trade. In other words, protectionism is always an equilibrium outcome, whereas free trade is only sometimes an equilibrium outcome depending on P. Now, if P is less than one half, that means there's a mixing equilibrium too, which is very nasty. I will not ask you about that one. That's a very gross equilibrium to think through. But it's kind of interesting, right? The main punchline here is, in this uncertain informational environment that is international relations, it, I, I assume that it seems plausible to you that countries have private information about their own foreign policies, right? That, I assume that seems reasonable to you. And look, P could be really close to one or really close to zero, which means that there isn't very much uncertainty. If P is really close to one, that means I, I'm almost positive you're a protectionist. And if P is really close to zero, that means I'm almost sure you're a cautious liberal. But I don't know for sure. And so long as I don't know for sure, the structure of trade means that free trade has to be sort of preserved. Free trade has to be protected because it only happens some of the time, whereas protectionism is always a reasonable outcome in this model. It's a big punchline, right? That's a big punchline. And you wouldn't be able to get that punchline. This is the smallest model that could give you that punchline. I know it's a big, scary, daunting model, but it's also the smallest model that teaches you the important point that protectionism is always an equilibrium outcome. In almost any trade model, there always exists an equilibrium that has some protectionist outcome, but only under certain conditions does free trade happen. That's a big punchline, right? That's a huge, huge, massive point worth remembering. Just like all of my points, obviously. But I think that one is especially remember worthy. Well, that's not even remotely close to a word, but let's just go with it. It's week 12. So even in the absence of an institutional context, you know, we talked about auctions last week and, and I, I kept saying, oh, information and institutions work together in interesting ways. Here, there is no institution. We're under anarchy in international relations. And if there were a trade institution, then there wouldn't be any confusion about what the states were doing. They would have signed up for a deal. In the absence of institutions to manage international trade, in the absence of that, we find ourselves in a bit of a quagmire, a really interesting, terrifying quagmire. And I think oscillations between this 
sort of sometimes cautious liberal equilibrium and sometimes protectionist equilibrium, I think you see a lot of oscillation in the equilibrium selection mechanism roughly every four years in the American context. But I think that's what's happening a lot of the times. Like we were in one equilibrium and then there was some shift and we went to the other. Or as, as different trade uh, partners become relevant, the P shifts, we become less and less um, certain about what's going on with the other trade partners' trade preferences. And so consequently, we might just go to the protection side just to be safe. That's all in here. That's all in here. If you if you go to the Council on Foreign Relations website, or if you read Foreign Affairs or any of the IR policy journals, you'll see this game essentially described every time there's a trade article. Every time there's something like this. It really helps you to see a lot of the important structure of trade war. So what do we talk about today? Well, I, re I really just wanted to get some more practice to make sure that you were feeling comfortable with this idea of incomplete information, this idea of type, this idea of knowing something about the game that maybe somebody else doesn't. And we, we came at that from a lot of different angles today, right? I mean, we, we hit the informational thing really three different ways. One was a standard one-sided incomplete information model of public good provision, where we learned some important lessons about how cost and information relate to one another. Then we went through a, a basically a, a thought experiment about what would happen in this model if player two knew the type versus if they didn't. And we saw that in that world, there was no credible way for the player that had more information to promise to do the thing that they would have done if they didn't have that information. Sort of a Plato's cave sort of thing. You'll never be able to go back into the cave. There's almost a curse of information. There's a curse of knowledge where it is impossible for you to behave as if you never gained some information that you gained. It's provocative in its own right, right? And then the C block, we said to ourselves, well, if we're willing to wrestle this massive, gigantic bear of two-sided incomplete information, can we learn some important substantive punchlines? And the answer, of course, was in the affirmative. We saw this really interesting, there's a conditionality of free trade that isn't there for protectionism. Protectionism is maybe an easy default setting, whereas free trade is something that it can only happen under certain conditions and only with an eye towards selecting that equilibrium out of many equilibria. However, it's with the B block's main lesson in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. You know, so more information can, can, can hurt. Okay, we talked about that. We saw in utility terms that more information can hurt, right? But there's, there's other ways that more information, I don't know about hurt, but more information isn't always better necessarily. There's this idea that if you if you continue to gather data on something, then your understanding of it will get more and more precise. Okay? So let's say that we're fighting. We're fighting a war together. And you don't know if I'm strong or not. You go in with some probabilistic expectation about whether I'm strong or not. Maybe I've got a distribution of types. You don't know how strong I am, but there's some variable that determines how strong I am. And you can look at it. Maybe, maybe it's distributed this way. Okay? Sorry for violating my own personal commitment not to have visuals in these provocative thoughts, but it's week 12. I'm allowed to do what I want. So maybe this is how you think that my strength is distributed. It's very likely that I have some, some moderate amount of strength and maybe there's some chance I'm super weak and some chance I'm super strong. It's a bell curve. It's just distributed. Let's just keep life super simple. And there's this idea that if you watched me fight for a day, if we fought a battle, there's this idea that that means that you're going to get a more precise sense about how strong I am. So let's say that we fought a battle and that you saw that I fought at, a, at a, like a moderate amount of strength. We had, we had a stalemate sort of fight. So you got a datum that suggested that maybe I had intermediate strength. You updated your beliefs via Bayes' rule, as we discussed last week. And next thing you know, you've got a tighter, you have more confidence. You have a tighter distribution. There's a smaller standard deviation in this distribution. You, you have a more precise sense about how strong I am because you came in with a prior, you came in with some belief about how strong I am, you saw me fight, you updated, you have a more precise sense. The usual logic goes that that's the way it's got to go. But that isn't true. Suppose instead that you went into the interaction thinking I had intermediate strength, just like before. 
and we went to the battlefield and fought a battle, and I kicked the shit out of you. Just consider that possibility. I'm not enthused about it. War is awful. You're my students. I care about you. Nevertheless, here we are fighting a battle, and I just, I just had a juggernaut. Well, because of the relationship between your prior and that outliery sort of outcome, somebody call Malcolm Gladwell, the variation in your posterior distribution does not have to become more precise. It is possible for more information to make you more confused, for you to have a more uncertain distribution about possibilities over my strength. You know less than you did before. If we continued the process, if we fought 10 or 20 or 50 battles, then chances are good that I would have had a bunch of intermediate outcomes during that, and then all would have been right in the world again. That's a pretty high cost to get more information, though. You know, if we're, if we're in a laboratory, every given subject that I get more data from, maybe I have to pay them a few more dollars to stay in the lab another hour. But fighting a war, fighting another battle, just in a probative sense, just fighting a battle to see if you can learn something, that's, that's, that's mean. Don't, don't put people's lives at stake just so that you can get a tighter distribution about how strong I am. That sounds a little bit nasty. So that's a simple point. That's a simple mathematical point. What's amazing to me is how often when I bring it up to people, and I don't mean students, I mean, I mean other academics, you have to show them that all the way. It doesn't occur to them that it's possible for more information to make you more confused. I don't know if they're especially sanguine, they're especially optimistic. You know, that these are people that are trained in data analysis and, and trained in how to, how to think about um, using data in, in interesting and important ways through statistics and using probability theory mostly to their advantage, it doesn't always occur to them that more information could be confusing. And I don't blame them for that. In most cases, that it is true that more information helps. But as we saw in the B-Blog today, more information in some situations can hurt. How do you know one situation from the other? Situations where more information helps is from situations where more information hurts. You don't. You don't get to know that. One big punchline I'd like you to get from this final third of the class is that inf incomplete information is reason to pause and reflect about how you feel about lots of things. I'm not telling you to change your opinion on anything. I would never want to do that, okay? However, the fact that you've the fact that somebody has has read a lot, the fact that somebody has a lot of data on a particular topic does not necessarily imply that they have a more precise understanding of it than somebody that didn't. More information can hurt. More information can confuse. Now, there are ways around that, right? So, so consider what most people would do. Let's say it wasn't a war. Let's just say it was a tennis match just to make this nice. Let's say that you didn't know how good of a tennis player I am. I've never played tennis, so I'm an awful tennis player. I don't know why tennis just popped into my head. So, so let's say that this was about tennis and not war. And you don't know how good of a tennis player I am. You just think that there's some distribution of how good I am. And we go to the tennis court and I beat the shit out of you. Now, a rational thing, a Bayes rule, all the way rational robot thing to do would be to update your beliefs and become more confused about how good I am. And maybe you would do that. Or maybe you would say, I'm ignoring that day. I just had an off day. Or he was just really on that day. That was just an off day. It was just a weird day. That was an aberration. I'm ignoring that data point. A lot of people do that. That's a psychological bias. People do not use data the same way depending on how much it comports with their priors. And that's a, that's a perfectly reasonable heuristic. I'm not telling you not to do that. But it does hurt an expectation. It leads to worse decisions. So in other words, we can... Use the strategy that leads to best decisions in expectation on the understanding that more information can hurt, more information can confuse, and we need to be humble. Or we can behave on the perfectly reasonable and maybe self-best heuristic of ignoring data that doesn't comport with our prior beliefs, making decisions that are in expectation worse, but not having to admit humility about anything. You may have guessed from my diction on the subject what I think is the proper way to go but I'm just one person that doesn't know anything more about tennis than you do. I say these things because I learn the most from people that surprise me. 
I learn the most from people not only that I disagree with. I mean, everybody likes to say, and it's, it's almost trite now. Oh, I learn from people I disagree with. I surround myself with people I disagree with. Bullshit. The more important thing is that you surround yourself with people that genuinely surprise you from time to time. Because those are the people that really put your prior beliefs to the test. And they really put your humility to the test. And I hope that this class has, from time to time, been surprising. I hope from time to time it's been uncomfortable, not just in a math skills sense, but in a conceptual sense. Because that discomfort is a real chance for you to work on this muscle of updating your beliefs in a principled way. I don't mean to preach at you. I'm sorry for, for that. I just think it's really important and, and too often ignored that learning more is great, but only if it's accompanied by an attendant development in your own perspective about things. If you don't know what I mean just yet, maybe you will know in a few years, because as one gets older, one gets more and more confused, and that's fine by me. It's awfully nice of you to continue to put up with me as I bloviate on these things like just some randomer just talking on some street corner shouting into the noise. And while I hope that these moments of surprise or confusion or discomfort have been having less and less for you, I, I hope that I hope you're growing comfortable with things. I hope you're not growing too comfortable because I really do think that a lot of, of a good college education is about coming out not only with, with education but with perspective. I wish that I'd come out of college that way, that's for sure. Heck, I wish I had perspective today. And I really do think that one of the best ways to learn that is to be shown these fables in a particular order, to be shown them from a particular point of view. You know, several weeks back I said that you're the star of your own fable, and I mean that. And I hope that as you continue to see more and more of these strange fables being thrown at you from all sorts of different interesting angles that might confuse or might surprise you, I hope that that's been a good growth experience for you. I have detected growth from many of you anyway. That makes this really rewarding and satisfying on my end. It makes me feel like there's more to this than just stupid scribbling. So thank you for that. And more importantly, thanks for watching.